Welcome to the Weights and Measures Primer. My name is Ross Anderson. This is part three of a video on the verification of Scale Division E task group recommendations. In part one, I address the correct understanding of E relating to accuracy and precision, and I explained how this impacts measurement of error and application of tolerances. I also explained that resolution in D is independent of the accuracy in E. In part two, I explained the rationale for the task group recommendations. In this video, I will show how the principles from part one get applied to various weighing instruments after the recommendations are in place. Again, for the record, I am not speaking for the task group. I am speaking as the original submitter of the item and a member of the task group. I find case studies help transition from theory to practice. In these case studies, the instruments that I've chosen are those where E does not equal D. I'll examine the conflicts and confusion in the current code, and I'll show how the task group recommendations eliminate them. This is a slide from part one showing the four kinds of instruments. You can see that the high resolution instruments appear at the top and we move down to normal and low resolution. I will start with the balancing instruments with undefined resolution, as these highlight the confusion surrounding E and D. Here is the current Handbook 44 definition of E. It specifically mentions ungraduated instruments, balances, because they have no divisions D. They don't indicate weight. They indicate a balanced condition. This confirms that E is not related to the instrument resolution in D, but to the actual weight used in verification, hence the verification scale division or interval. We immediately find conflicts. The code makes marking of class, capacity, and D mandatory. There are no exceptions. We find confusion in Table 3 since Column 2 is labeled in D or E, and I contend the code never explains how to decide which to use. The tolerance in Table 6 are expressed in Scale Divisions D. The sensitivity requirement is specified in Scale Divisions D. Finally, the minimum loads in Table 8 are specified in Ds. How do we apply any requirement in Ds to an instrument? with no Ds. Here's how the task group proposes to fix things. Marking for a balancing instrument consists of class, capacity, and E, no D. Class requirements in Table 3 are exclusively in E. Test loads and tolerances in Table 6 are exclusively in E. The sensitivity requirement will be expressed in E. Minimum load is specified in E since this is based on the rounding to the smallest increment of counterbalance weights, which is also tied to the sensitivity. Once we understand that E is actual weight embodied in the test weights, there should be no more confusion. There are two tests of the balancing instrument. The ratio test verifies the beam ratios. Both pans are loaded with equivalent test weights in E. The addition of the tolerance test weight in E must at least restore balance to any out-of-balance condition. The sensitivity tests conducted near zero load and at maximum test load. Starting at a balanced condition, the addition of error weights specified in E must result in a permanent change in the balance indicator. You might ask about the increasing load test. I contend that this test does not test the instrument accuracy, but rather the accuracy of the counterbalance weights. The balancing instrument case study should help clarify the difference between E and D. The verification scale division or interval E is specified and used by the manufacturer to describe the accuracy class of the instrument pursuant to Table 3. Note that Table 3 is a specification directed to the manufacturer, not a tolerance directed to the official. E is used by the official or technician to describe the test loads and tolerances in Table 6. In both cases, E is actual weight and not instrument indication. 
The scale division D is the smallest increment of weight indication. This is just resolution, and it is not connected to the accuracy in E. In commerce, there are no test loads or tolerances in play. Instead, there is only indicated weight in weight units based with increments of D. I note one exception. For the balancing instrument, where the weight value is the sum of the counterbalance weights, still actual weight, not a weight indication. The next case study is the weight classifier. These are low-resolution instruments with D typically larger than E and often much larger. The other important distinction is the rounding, where these instruments round up as opposed to the normal half-up, half-down rounding. We find three of the same conflicts described earlier for the balancing instruments, notably confusion relating to Table 3, Accuracy Class, Table 6, Tolerances, and Table 8, Minimum Load. In Tables 3 and 6, we are taught to use E, but I submit there is no direction in the code to support this. In Table 8, the minimum load is specified in D, but does this make sense, as D can be equal to E or even 100 E? The proposed revisions resolve all of the questions and conflicts. Class requirements as well as test loads and tolerances are correctly specified in terms of actual weight in E. The minimum load of 5E borrowed from R76 is a special exemption. It reflects the roundup feature of these instruments and the fact that the resolution of the instrument is disconnected from the accuracy. The test of a weight classifier is complicated by the roundup operation. To properly test these instruments, you must use test option 1 with air weights and adjust the test load to produce a whole number of Ds of indication. Because of the larger values of D in the roundup, we can't use option 2 since you typically can't resolve errors to E, let alone to point 2E. Next, we move to the high resolution instruments. I start with those instruments with the auxiliary indicating device, described in detail in parts 1 and 2. For these instruments, D is smaller than E. As to conflicts, we find three of the same conflicts in Table 3 Accuracy Class, Table 6 Tolerances, and Table 8 Minimum Load. In Table 3 and 6, we are taught to use E, but again, I submit there's no direction in the code to support this, particularly for tolerances. In Table 8, the minimum load is specified in D, but many believe it should be E because we also changed from D to E in Tables 3 and 6. The proposed revisions resolve all the questions and conflict. Class requirements as well as test loads and tolerances are correctly specified in terms of actual weight in E. The minimum load is specified in D for these instruments. This is because minimum load is related to rounding to the scale division D, which is independent of the accuracy in E. High resolution instruments prompt us to ask three questions. First question, why differentiate the least significant digit on the digital scale? Notice that the analog equivalents require two operations to determine a weight value. First, you read the primary scale corresponding to the index. Second, you further subdivide the primary scale division using the vernier or writer. In the special case of class 1 with E equal 1 milligram, D can be very much smaller than E. In the example here, D is 1 1,000th of an E. The differentiated D on digital instruments is not the result of a second operation. I believe R76 differentiated it to maintain some equivalence to analog technology. It also reduces likelihood of misapplying the tolerance to D. Second question, why does R76 exclude instruments with an auxiliary indicating device from direct sales? For analog instruments, this makes perfect sense to me. The customer may not be schooled in operating verniers and riders and won't fully understand the indication. We don't want that in commerce. But with digital, all the customer sees are numerical digits. I can't see any reason why these should be excluded from direct sales. 
as I have tried to explain, the tests verify that the Ds are accurate and uniform. Are we excluding them just to maintain some equivalency with analog? Third question, why use high-resolution instruments in the first place? Here are three good reasons. Smaller Ds result in smaller price increments in transactions. As commodities get more valuable, the value of one increment of scale gets larger. For cannabis with prices of $20 per gram, an increment of 0.1 gram is $2 in price. An increment of 0.01 gram is only 20 cents in price. Smaller Ds permit smaller minimum loads since the rounding error is reduced and smaller Ds can make testing easier. Once D is 0.2E or smaller, you no longer need to use error weights because you can use test option 2. I'm reusing a slide from part 1. Remember that the blue shaded rows use test option 1 and the yellow shaded rows use test option 2. I've made two changes from part 1. I've changed the error resolution in the second and third rows from the bottom to be one-fifth of the tolerance. These are weight classifiers and normal resolution scales where E equals D. Remember, we can still use test option 2 when E equals D if the instrument has an extended displaying device. I've added a row with no shading for LP meters with temperature compensation. We will find that neither test option 1 nor test option 2 works for these instruments. I'll explain with the case study of a similar high-resolution weighing instrument, the dynamic monorail scale. I thought of a way to confirm that we are really verifying indications to D, even with the auxiliary indicating device. Consider an instrument with E equal 10D, where the error is plus 0.4E at 5000 E test load using test option 2. You should see that a linear instrument should have a plus 0.4E error over a range of test loads of about 1250E. If you revert to test option 1 and test at some odd indication, say 49958D, you will find the test load is 4995.4E, and the error is still plus 0.4E. It is not just the Ds equal to Es that are accurate. All of the Ds are accurate because they must be uniform in size. Moving on, the dynamic monorail with an auxiliary indicating device is covered in S1222. Current instruments all have a D smaller than E, which means they are high resolution. But notice that E does not have to be a 1, and the D is not differentiated like class 1 or 2. Typical instruments are class 3. For beef, 750 pound capacity with E equal 1 pound and D equal 0.1 pound. For pork, 500 pound capacity with E equal 0.5 pound and D equal 0.1 pound. Remember that for class 3 up to N equal 1000, the accuracy is 0.2%. The dynamic monorail measures the gross load of the trolley and carcass in motion and then subtracts a stored tear weight to produce a net weight for the carcass. This is the only weight recorded for commerce. The code does not specify how to round the net calculations. The first calculation shown has two round-offs, and the second calculation has only one round-off. I believe most manufacturers have chosen the second option. Also, I learned that they typically store the tear weight to the internal resolution, meaning unrounded. Going back to my three reasons to use high resolution, we find that the first two do not apply to the dynamic monorail. One-pound divisions seem to be fine for these commodities regarding price increments, and these instruments are not used in the very low end of their weighing range. The sole reason they are high resolution is to make testing easier, or rather to make testing possible. There are challenges in testing a dynamic monorail. Test option 1 is not viable since the initial measurement is dynamic. You can't use error weights in motion to adjust the test load, and thus you can't get a whole number of Ds of indication. Test option 2 is not viable since the test loads are randomly selected, that is, trolley and carcass, and they cannot be expected to be a whole number of E. In addition, the weight indication is net weight, 
less the stored tear of the trolley. We need a third test option. This instrument is akin to the LP meter mentioned earlier and also other compensating instruments that indicate something other than what was measured. Test option three is a universal option with hybrid options one and two. We resolve both the actual quantity and the indication to point two E or smaller to satisfy the one-fifth rule. Notice how this clarifies the proper test. For the dynamic monorail, the trolley and carcass test load is measured to point two E or better on a reference scale verified prior to conducting the test. To get the indication for the test, we must add the stored tear weight to the net weight to get back to the gross weight of the trolley and carcass that was measured. With the task group recommendations, there is a new alternative to use an extended displaying device. Let me illustrate using the error model and a monorail with E equal 1 pound and D equal 0.1 pound. The first step is to calibrate the reference scale with divisions of 0.2 E or smaller. We can thus say that the calibrated reference scale is indicating actual weight. We may need to carefully adjust the scale calibration or use corrections to accomplish this. For the high resolution monorail scale, essentially with an auxiliary indicating device, we add back the 4.184 pound stored tear weight to the net weight recorded. Do not round this value off. This results in the indicated weight of the trolley and carcass of 472.584 pound, which is resolved to 0.2 E or better. In this example, the error is 472.584 pound indicated minus 472.4 actual or plus 0.184 pound. If you round the calculated gross indication or the error, you distort the error by rounding twice. For an instrument like the LP meter, you also don't round off the compensation calculations. Usually this is converting the gross proof reading to a compensated value. The task group is also offering a new alternative. The new alternative is to use an extended displaying device. For the dynamic monorail, this could entail providing the net weight resolved to 0.2e. When you add back the unrounded tear of the trolley, you get the indicated gross weight. It could also entail providing the gross weight of the trolley and carcass, matching the weight on the reference scale resolved to 0.2e or better. This should yield the same error as with the auxiliary indicating device. The graphic shows the important difference between the two indication options. The Ds of the auxiliary indicating device must be uniform in size. The divisions of the extended displaying device may vary in size. What we're seeing here is the case where there is 13.27 internal counts per division. When the division is subdivided by 10, some Ds are one count and others are two counts, decided by the rounding algorithm. There's an important question. How should the actual weight in E of the test weights impact the commercial transaction? I contend it doesn't, as E's are actual weight. Transactions are all conducted in weight units based on displayed divisions D. The D's are separate and independent of E. For example, do we express retail motor fuel sales in one cubic inch increments? That's the actual volume increment used in the test. No, transactions are 2.001 gallon. There are problems with UR310. First, if the instrument indicates to 0.1 pound, but you want the transaction 1 pound, you have to round a second time, and this adds bias in the rounding. Second, E is actual weight of the reference standards, and they are not present during commercial transactions, only during testing. If you want to conduct commerce to one pound divisions on a dynamic monorail, then create systems with extended displaying devices to facilitate testing. If you use a system with a scale division D smaller than E, i.e. with the auxiliary indicating device, the transactions are conducted to the smallest increment D. I believe UR310 is the result of the misunderstanding that we verified E and that E was part of the weight indication. E is actual weight embodied in the test weights. I've shown that we verify the Ds in our test. 
At this point, you might think we're done with high-resolution instruments. But there are still others hidden in Handbook 44. The next case study is Class 3L, a high-resolution class. Class 3L continues a long-standing practice to have large scales with 0.2% tolerances and small scale divisions. Users, and I think officials too, fail to recognize the difference between accuracy and resolution. When moving to R76 principles, you could move to class 3 with between 500 and 1000 scale divisions and still have 0.2% accuracy. You could move to class 4 with lower accuracy, close to 0.3%. Neither solution satisfied users or the officials back in 1984. A pre-1984 instrument may have had 10,000 divisions and a tolerance of 400 pounds at capacity and 200 pounds at 100,000 pounds. Look how the 200K pre-1984 instrument could fit in R76 class 3. At equal 500 pounds, that's not permitted as it would be 400N. An E of 200 pounds has N equal 1,000, an accuracy of 0.2%, the same as pre-1984. An E of 100 pounds has N equal 2,000, an accuracy of 0.1%. I don't think today's Class three instruments could meet this tolerance. An E of 50 or 20 pounds results in even higher accuracies outside the reach of instruments often used outdoors. The compromise reached back then was perhaps the single most difficult part of adapting R76 into the scales code. E was forced to equal D. In the previous example, E should have been 200 pound, but was forced to be 20 pound. Small D was allowed consistent with the previous practice. The tolerance structure was modified from R76 three-step system to a constant 0.2% expressed as 1 E tolerance per 500 E load. This results in potentially 20 D of tolerance at 10,000 E. This is high resolution. The code would try to follow R76 principles, but this was not easy. The first four exceptions or allowances deal with E and testing. Temperature effect on zero was expanded to 3 E per 5 F versus 1E for class 3. Time dependence expanded to 1.5E versus 0.5E for class 3. Zero load return expanded to one half the applicable tolerance versus 0.5E. The applicable tolerance is the tolerance for the test weights removed. Notice all of these increase tolerances. The last item works the opposite. As the minimum N for the class is more stringent at 2000 versus 500 for class 3. The next four exceptions deal with D and indications. The zero tracking window was expanded to 3D versus 0.5D for class 3, a six fold increase. Stability to permit zero or printing was expanded to 3D versus 1D. There is no requirement to differentiate D or make E a 1 as E was forced to equal D. The minimum load was increased to 50D versus 20D for class 3. For comparison, observe that for a D of 200 pounds for class 3, the minimum load is 4,000 pounds as compared with the 1,000 pound minimum load we have with D of 20 pounds for class 3L. Notice the reduced scale divisions D result in a lower minimum load parallel to the auxiliary indicating device. The important thing to recognize is that the two scales, class 3 at 200K by 200 pound and class 3L 200K by 20 pound have the same accuracy. Remember that the errors cannot invade the area under the step risers. This means class 3L scales are akin to the class 1 or 2 with the auxiliary indicating device. Since you can use test option 2 and you don't have to take out error weights. One additional point about class 3L. I'll illustrate using class 2 with two tolerance steps. The pinch points for type evaluation where the tolerance is tightest 
occurs at the first tolerance step on the high side of the curvature and at capacity on the low side of the curvature. However, if we switch to a 0.01% acceptance tolerance structure parallel to class 3L, the red dashed lines, the pinch point with the tightest tolerance occurs at 500E. This was discussed at length in the NTEP weighing sector, particularly as it impacts class 3L load cells. When they fail, it is almost always at the 500E first tolerance step. Going back to the reasons to have high resolution, we see all three come into play with class 3L. Smaller D means smaller price increments, which I believe was the prime reasons for having smaller D pre-1984. Smaller D means smaller minimum loads, as discussed earlier. And finally, smaller D permits the use of test option 2 with no error weights. This is a real revelation, as NTEP is playing with two-pound error weights where there is no need. The smaller D also facilitates strain load and substitution testing, since you are always resolving errors to one-fifth of the real tolerance. The key is to recognize Class 3L as high-resolution Class 3 instruments. There's one more high-resolution case to consider. My last case study involves highway weight enforcement scales, which were placed in a modified Class 4. Pre-1984, these were 2% accuracy instruments. Class 4 was modified to double the tolerance and increase the maximum N from 1,000 to 1,200. Like the pre-1984 instruments, these are high-resolution instruments. A search of NTEP certificates yielded this list of capacities and E's. Like Class 3L, E must equal D for these instruments. But notice that the resolution is never less than one-fifth of the maintenance tolerance at the pinch points. Here are some examples with two times Class 4 tolerances marked by the black stepped lines. A pinch point is where the test load has the smallest relative tolerance. For the 24K by 20 pound scale, the pinch point is at 1200E with a tolerance of 0.8%. That's the red envelope. The blue envelope at 400E has a tolerance of 1.5%. For the 40K by 50 pound scale, the pinch points are at 800E with a relative tolerance of 1.3%. Back at 400E, the tolerance is 1.5%. For the 30K by 50 pound scale, the pinch point is at 400E, with a relative tolerance of 1.5%. At 600E capacity, the tolerance is 1.7%. The critical thing to see is that test option two allows us to resolve errors for all of these scales to about one-fifth of the maintenance tolerance at the pinch point without the need for error weights. This is because they are high-resolution instruments parallel to the Class 1 or 2, the dynamic monorail, or the Class 3L. I have suggested to the task group that we should add something to the general code that formalizes the one-fifth rule. I can find nothing in the code today regarding the right division size for a prover a reference scale, or error weights. Here is the text proposed in Part 1. It would formalize an important issue regarding testing, driven by the science, not by anyone's personal feelings. Here is a parallel section from the scales code that is slightly revised from the task group recommendation. This adds detail and helps identify the special case of Class 3L and Class 4 weight enforcement scales. This concludes the case studies. I hope the discussion of the various kinds of instruments has helped solidify your understanding of the difference between D and E. Ds are the smallest increment of indication, and Es are the scale of actual weight used in testing. I also hope this has reinforced the need to make the changes proposed by the test group. Thank you for listening.